So just welcome him as, as we shift gears. Thank you. Oh, what a, what a wonderful morning. Can I get a little more juice on the mic if I need it? So I'm just going to hold it down here. I used to put it on my chin, and it gave me rug burn. I don't know how Emily does that. Maybe it's the facial hair. That's what, when I put the mic on my chin. Oh, got it. Good morning, you guys. How we doing? I'm excited for what God has today. We're going to dive on in. You guys ready? All right. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you that you're already here, moving among us. We just go ahead and put out your hands in front of you like this, just as a a sign of faith that you're going to receive something today. We thank you that you have a deposit of Jesus to release this morning. A deposit of your glory and your splendor, Jesus. A deposit of your power. Your resurrection power. I speak to dead places are coming to life in Jesus' name. Dead finances are coming to life. Dead relationships are coming to life. Hope is being released this morning. Hope is being released this morning. Hope. I I just declare things that you never thought would come back to life. Jesus is resurrecting because he has conquered all and risen victorious. Amen. So I want to share a story today. It's a story of a man named Peter, and he's a disciple of Christ, and he encounters the risen Christ. He encounters the risen Jesus of Nazareth, and it changes his whole life. It changes everything. So I'm going to give you a little, a little backdrop on Peter. Uh, he was a fisherman. So he, I read just very briefly about these guys. They would have been kind of the blue-collar workers of the day. Um, It's just a rough and tough business, out on boats all the time, out on boats in the night. Lots of tough culture around this. So it kind of gives you a picture of what this guy was like, very blue-collar. And uh, Jesus calls Peter in Luke 5. So we're going to go to Luke 5. Go ahead and turn there, if you will, with me. Verses 1 through 11. It's going to be up on the screen. Jesus meets Peter in Luke 5 on the Lake Galilee. Okay, so he's fishing on this lake. You can go ahead and follow along with me here. On one occasion, Jesus was preaching to a crowd on the shore of Lake Galilee. A vast multitude of people was pushing to get close to Jesus to hear the word of God. He noticed two fishing boats at the water's edge with the fishermen nearby rinsing their nets. Jesus climbed the boat, into the boat belonging to Simon Peter, and said to him, let me use your boat. (laughs) Push it off a short distance from the shore so I can speak to the crowd. So Jesus sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished, he said to Peter, now row out to deep water and cast your nets, and you'll have a great catch. I want you to remember that sentence he just says right there. Now row out to deep water and, and cast your nets, and you will have a great catch. That's going to come in later. Master Peter replied, We've just come back from fishing all night, and we didn't catch a thing. If you insist, we'll go out again and let down our nets because of your word. When they pulled up their nets, they were shocked to see a huge catch of fish, and their nets were ready to burst. They waved to their business partners in the other boat for help. They ended up completely filling the boats with fish until they began to sink. That's a crazy amount of fish. When Simon Peter saw this astonishing miracle, he knelt at Jesus' feet and begged him, Go away from me, Master, for I am a sinful man. Isn't that amazing? You know, like, the power of a miracle always releases the, the testimony of Jesus, which is love. Love that nothing can separate us from. And see, I, th- I think about why does he say, Master, go away from me, I am a sinful man, and he just met him. Because when Jesus brought that catch of fish, it wasn't just a magic art. It was the power of the love of God manifested. And when Peter met that presence released on that shore, he was immediately aware that he needed this person to be his savior. He was not, he did not, he was not learned in the scriptures. He was not a student. He was a fisherman. His heart came alive 
in the presence of the power of God in Jesus Christ. And he repented automatically. Repentance is the result of the good presence of God touching your heart. And when he heals you, he's releasing his virtue into you. And it releases breakthrough for you to be saved. Isn't that amazing? Go away from me, master, for I am a sinful man. Simon Peter and the other and the other fishermen, including his fishing partners, Jacob, John, and the sons of Zebedee, were awestruck over the miracle catch of fish. Jesus answered Simon, Do not yield to your fear, Simon Peter. From now on, you will catch men for salvation. (laughs) That's amazing. You know, it's not a mistake what you're doing for God in the natural. Right? Simon was a fisherman, but he was a fisherman in the spirit as well. From now on, you will catch men for salvation. After pulling their boats to shore, they left everything behind. Say that with me. They left everything behind and followed Jesus. Okay, let's try that all at once. They left everything behind and followed Jesus. It's amazing to me that this man, Jesus, did a miracle and they left everything behind and followed him. But why? I think it's the first time in their life they felt the presence, the manifested glory of God in that miracle. And it, and it sparked something so deep inside of them. They said, I will leave what provides for my children, my, wi- my wives, my, my families, and I'm going to follow this man. He is now my master. It's the power of the presence of love in Jesus. So, so Peter, become, he's a fisherman, but becomes a follower of Jesus. How many of you know there's 12 disciples of Jesus, right? But there's three that are in the, quote, inner circle of Jesus. And, you know, people are like, that's not fair. He can't have best friends. But he did. Uh, Jesus had best friends. And it was these three. It was Peter, James, and John. So Peter becomes really one of the prominent disciples of Jesus for this reason. People remember him because he had so much faith and tenacity and boldness that it got him in trouble. There, there were times where he, just, he, he was the first to speak, and it was completely wrong. He was the first to try and do something, and Jesus has to rebuke him. Jesus is like, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do, Peter. But Peter had this thing where he encountered that love that he was sold out. I'm leaving everything, and I'm going 100% to follow this man, Jesus. And he becomes one of the most intimate disciples close to Jesus, one of the three in the inner circle. He has the privilege of having a revelation. Say revelation. How many of you know you need a revelation to be saved? Because information is knowledge, but revelation is actually impartation, right? And revelation comes from the spirit man. And Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, only the Father could reveal that to you, Peter. Peter is favored to have a revelation, an internal knowing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Peter is privileged to see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is where Jesus goes up on the mountain. He brings his best friends, his three best friends with him, Peter, James, and John. I think I said those three, right? And um, they're on the, the mountain. And, you know, Jesus, he looked like a man, like just like I look up here. 100% flesh and man, right? He had no sparkling glitter around him. He had no halo. He maybe in the spirit, but in the natural, he was a man. So he goes up on this mountain and his appearance matches what's in the spirit. He is transfigured. His figure becomes glorious and shines bright, radiant splendor on this mountaintop. And God's manifest presence, the presence of Yahweh, comes in a cloud and and encapsulates them all and says, this is my son. Listen to him. Peter gets the privilege of seeing the manifestation of the glory of the Son of God on a mountain in the flesh in real time. He gets to see that. Peter also gets to to walk on water. Who gets to have that on your resume? (laughs) That's incredible. Think about that. Like, just go out into the Pacific Ocean and you just walk on the water. But it wasn't just on the water. It was in a storm. It's incredible. Peter gets the privilege. You know, like I said, he's full of faith and boldness. And Jesus is walking on the water. And they're 
very, very afraid they're going to die. And these are fishermen, so you know it's real bad. It's like Deadliest Catch. How many of you guys have watched that show? These guys are hardcore. They're not afraid of anything, and they're shaking. And all of a sudden, the Son of God comes walking on the waves. <laughs> and Peter's like, if it's you, tell me to join you. I mean, this guy's amazing. I want to be like Peter. I want that faith. I want that tenacity that is so bold as to do that. Je Peter becomes intimate with Jesus. He grows a deep bond. How many of you have been on a missions trip before? How many of you have done anything that's good for other people? <laughs> Mow your neighbor's lawn together with a group of people. Paint a school. When you do something for God or for charity or even just because you want to be nice, honestly, and you do it with a group of people, there's a bond that happens there, isn't there? Unlike where you work, unlike your family, see, because there becomes a culture in those places that are status quo. But when you go outside of your normal and you put your hands to a mission and a purpose with a group of people, there's a bond that happens that you can't get in other places. And Peter had the privilege of developing a bond with Jesus for three and a half years. They preached the gospel together. They healed the sick together. They raised the dead together. They walked on the water together. They had revelations together. They ate, slept, pooped, went to sleep again, woke up. They did life together as men in the flesh, a brotherhood, a bond, unbreakable. When everyone left Jesus, when he preached what Emily was referring to, he said, eat, eat my... <laughs> I think that's okay to share. It was, it was sweet. Some of the kids in here earlier were like, it, Courtney was explaining communion to them, and they're like, ew, no, I don't want to do that. Eat his flesh and drink his blood? No. <laughs> like, that's the natural response without a revelation. Because the information, it demands you have a revelation to actually come into it. No one understands eating someone's flesh and blood unless the Spirit reveals it to you. So um, when, Peter pre when Jesus preached that message, hundreds of people left. And Peter said, I'm staying with you. Peter said, I'm staying with you. There was a deep commitment and bond that Peter had to Jesus. He was faithful to the end. But we're going to actually read about where Peter falls short. Peter fails. After three years of what I described, leaving everything to give himself to this man as master and Lord, he betrays him, denies him, and falls short of glory. So let's go to John 13, okay? John 13, verse 36 through 38. Jesus is, this is the, the Passover, the Last Supper um, meal is the context. And Jesus is starting to explain to his men, as he has been at different points, he's like, I'm, I'm leaving, which I've always wondered, what are the disciples thinking when he says it? And he says it so clearly. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, be persecuted, and die. And they're like, okay, whatever, moving on. And they're still so confused when it happens, you know? I don't, I don't understand that, but he starts to tell them they're leaving, and, and who, who pipes up? Who can, can you guess? Peter. Peter. He is so committed to Jesus. He says, he interjected, interjected into Jesus what he's saying, but master, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you will not be able to follow, but one day you will follow me there. Peter said, what do you mean I'm not able to follow you now? I can hear his tone of voice. What do you mean I'm not able to follow you now? I'll do anything for you. And that's what he says. I would sacrifice my life to die for you. Jesus answered, would you really lay down your life for me, Peter? Here's the absolute truth. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will say three times that you don't even know me. That's amazing. So the night continues on, they finish dinner, they go to the garden, and Jesus is betrayed by uh, Judas. Jesus is arrested. We're going to turn to Matthew 26, verse, starting in verse 69. Jesus is arrested and drug into the court of the religious people, and they are interrogating him. They have punched him in the face, spit on his face, they're mocking him, they're interrogating him, and they're falsely accusing him, and they're condemning him. Um, and by this point, there's only a few a few disciples are there in the court and they're at a distance and Peter's one of them. We're going to pick up right there, Matthew 26, verse 69. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard when a servant girl came up to him and said, I recognize you. 
You were with Jesus the Galilean. In front of everyone, Peter denied it and said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Later, as he stood near the the gateway of the courtyard, another servant girl noticed him and said, I know this man is a follower of Jesus, the Nazarene. Once again, Peter denied it, and with an oath, he said, I tell you, I don't know the man. A short time later, those standing nearby approached Peter and said, we know you're one of his disciples. We can tell by your speech. Your Galilean accent gives you away. Peter denied it. Using profanity, he said, I don't know the man. (laughs) At that very moment, the sound of a crowing rooster pierced the night. I bet you Peter wanted to kill every rooster he heard after that day. (laughs) I'm going to strangle that thing. (laughs) Anyway, um, so Peter remembered the prophecy of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. With a shattered heart, Peter left the courtyard sobbing with tears. In Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus turned and looked at Peter when he heard the rooster crow. Can you imagine that moment? Jesus turns and looks as he's being beaten, condemned, and punched, and slapped, and humiliated, and he looks eye to eye with Peter. Peter said, I don't know him. He made an oath. It'd be like this. I swear on my mother's grave, I don't know that man. He says, I effing don't know that man. That's what he says, what the Bible says. He swore and included his master's name in it. I effing don't know that guy. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Peter does not, does possibly the most painful thing you could ever do to your Lord and your master. While he is being condemned and sentenced to death, you deny even knowing him. And someone you don't even know, you deny knowing him to someone you don't even know, a middle school-aged girl. You turn your back on the one you've loved for three years, and you just told him earlier that night you would die for him. And Peter knew in his heart he would die for him. He thought, he was convinced, I'm going to die for this man. And he's met with this cold, bitter reality that he would deny him to a middle school-aged girl. That was, that was enough for him to give up his love to a little tiny child. He's intimidated by that moment. He says, I don't know him. I swear I don't know him. I effing don't know that man. That's heartbreaking. Peter went into the night sobbing, and Jesus went into the night with a plan. Jesus went into the night, and he died the next day on the cross. And you see, Peter's story doesn't end here. Peter's story doesn't end that night. Let's go to John 21. This is where it gets so good. John 21, 1 through 19. So Jesus goes into the night, and we, we know the story. I'm not going to go through it all. He dies on the cross the next day. Three days later, he raises from the dead by the supernatural, almighty power of God. He bursts through the tomb in glory, and he begins to appear to his people. It's amazing. John 21, he appears to his disciples. Later, Jesus appeared once again to a group of his disciples by the Lake Galilee. Okay, it happened one day while Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, Jacob... John and the two other disciples were all together. I want to remind you, those are the same group besides the ones that were added, uh, Peter and I think John and the sons of Zebedee. They were there in Luke 5. Do you guys remember that? I told you to keep note of that. Peter and those boys were fishing in Luke 5 the day Jesus called them, okay? Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They all replied, we'll go with you. So they went out and fished through the night but caught nothing. Then at, at um, excuse me, at dawn, Jesus was standing there on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was him. He called out to them saying, hey guys, did you catch any fish? Not a thing, they replied. Jesus shouted to them, throw your net over the starboard side and you'll catch some. And so they did as he said, and they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull in the net. Does this sound familiar? 
This is not an accident. This is not a coincidence. This is the intentional love of Jesus Christ that Peter says three times, I don't know him, once with an oath and once with a swear word. And the next, after he sees him, he sees him once before this. But Jesus appears on the same lake that he appeared on and called him three and a half years earlier. And, and Jesus says to them, after they were with the same group of guys, plus a few, the same group of guys are out there fishing, and Jesus says, have you caught a thing? Oh my gosh, it's the same thing that happened three and a half years ago. Have you caught a thing? No, we've been fishing all night. Fast forward three and a half years. Have you caught a thing? No, we've been fishing all night. Jesus said to them three and a half years earlier, cast your net on the other side. Three and a half years later, he says to them again, cast your net on the other side. Jesus is intentionally recreating the moment that he met Peter. He is intentionally recreating the encounter where Peter met the, resurrect, uh, met the love of Jesus. He is intentionally recreating the moment that he said, I choose you, Peter. He did the same miracle, the same lake, the same group of people, the same night of failure of no catching fish. And he comes to him again. He recreated the moment that they met. You know, can you imagine? This is a sad example, but can you imagine this? If my wife is being tried unjustly for something that she never did, and I'm in the courtroom, and these men are punching her, slapping her, spitting on her, and, and some middle school girl comes up to me and says, I, I think you're her husband, aren't you? And I said, no, I don't know her. And then someone else comes up and says, you're her husband, aren't you? I swear on my mother's grave, I don't know that woman. As they're slapping her, accusing her, spitting in her face. And I say the third time, I don't effing know that woman. My wife. And she goes and dies for that unjust claim. And then when I'm out fishing, she shows up on the beach. I would be scared <laughs> if she said that. <laughs> she, there she is. If I, if I heard her say, if you caught anything, I'd be like, oh my gosh. I'm, Peter dove towards the, I would have dive, I swam out. I'm like, I'm, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. But that's, you know what would be amazing if Courtney came on the shore and said, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, Nathaniel, I choose you again. That's what Jesus did. He called out to them. He said, have you caught anything? He intentionally is recreating that moment where he chose Peter and Peter's heart was overcome with his love. He's saying, Peter, I do. I choose you for better or for worse today. I choose you again, Peter. Can you imagine the feeling in Peter's heart? Thum, 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 thum. The adrenaline shooting from the adrenal, adrenal gland going down, running through your toes and up through the top of your head. You guys know that feeling I'm talking about? Where you're like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I just heard what, I, did I just hear that? He would have flashed back to that moment that he was met by Jesus' love the first time. So we can go back up to the scriptures here. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Peter heard him say that, he quickly grabbed, wrapped his outer garment around him, and because he was athletic, he dove right in that lake to go to Jesus. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm redeemed. The other disciple then brought the boat to shore, dragging their catch of fish. Jesus is so generous. He calls him back to himself with a miracle catch of fish. Thousands of dollars probably that was worth, by the way. Hey, here, have some money. Come back to me. I'm going to marry you again unbelievable dragging their fish they weren't far from the land about 100 meters they got to the shore they noticed a charcoal fire with some roasted fish and bread jesus said bring the fish okay skipping down a few okay he served them breakfast after they had breakfast jesus said to peter simon son of jonah do you burn with love for me more than these peter answered yes lord you know that i have great affection for you then take care of my lambs. Jesus said, Jesus said, 
period. No matter how many times I went over this, I said that wrong every single time. Okay. Jesus repeated his question the second time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me? Peter answered, yes, my Lord. You know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of Jonah, do you have great affection for me? Peter, saddened by being asked a third time, said, my Lord, you know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. So Jesus recreates in this the moment that he denied him three times over a bed of coals. He recreates the moment that he called him in the beginning. And now he brings it full circle. He says, I'm calling you again. Now, step one, let me bring you to your place of greatest failure. Let me bring you to the pit, the fire pit that you were over where you confessed that you don't know me. You don't know me. You confessed you don't know me. I'm going to bring you to that again. I'm going to ask you three times, do you know me? Do you love me? And Peter says, yes, yes, and yes. See, it's funny how Yahweh asks us questions when we're in sin. Remember in the garden? Where are you? He didn't say, I know exactly what happened. He said, where are you? He wanted a conversation. Jesus says, do you love me? How many times have you heard that preached like he was, he was giving Peter the opportunity to redeem himself? No, he was redeeming Peter. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't unsure of if Peter was going to be his follower. He was there to remind Peter who he was. I have called you still. The same way I did three and a half years ago, I call you today. Because it's me. I am the common denominator in your calling. I am the one who's called you. You know what? Do you love me? Yes, you do, Peter. I know you. And I want you to hear three times. He was redeeming Peter's conscience. He was redeeming Peter's self-hatred. He was redeeming Peter's betrayal. He was redeeming Peter's failure. He's saying, I know that you love me, and I want you to know it too. Isn't that amazing? He didn't ask Peter this question because he was unsure of Peter's love for him, but because Peter was unsure of his love for Jesus. Jesus asked this question because he knew Peter was lost. He asked it so Peter could hear his own answer. You do love me, Peter. And then what does he say to him? Feed my sheep. Isn't that interesting? He says, do you love me? Yes, then feed my sheep. What is he doing? He's empowering him. How many of you th could think of someone who denies and stabs their master in the back, and then uh, later that week, Jesus reinstates him? <laughs> Only true love has the power to do that. Say, nope, I still called you. You're still mine. In fact, I'm giving you your calling back. Feed my lambs. You do love me. You do love me. Feed my sheep. Peter, listen, when you were younger, you made your own choices and you want where you were pleased. But one day when you are old, others will tie you up and escort you where you would not choose to go. You will spread your arms, spread out your arms. Jesus said this to Peter as a prophecy of what kind of death he would die for the glory of God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. This is amazing. Like, do you know what that's referencing? That's referencing when Peter said, I would die for you. I would give my life for you. And Jesus, and Jesus says, you will deny me three times. But Jesus, when he comes back to life, he gives him back. He gives him a prophetic word. One day, Peter, you will die for me. One day you will die for me. And not only will you die for me, you will die the same way I died for you. You will die on a cross. Isn't that incredible? Peter said, I'm going to die for you, Jesus. And he failed. And Jesus said, you're going to die for me, Peter. He gave him back the desire of his heart because he put it there in the first place. He redeems him. He goes to the shore of his greatest failure and he redeems his calling. He recalls him to himself. He redeems his greatest failure and denial of him. He says, you do love me, and here's your calling to feed my sheep. And now I'm going to top it off by saying, one day you will die for the glory of Yahweh. 
He gives him back everything. He says, I know who you are. I know you're the one I've called. You're the one I'm in love with. You're the one I've chosen. You're destined for greatness. See, some of you, when you're in that place on the fire, the enemy comes, and some of you are maybe in this moment right now where you go three and a half years strong. You go three and a half years committed, and then all of a sudden, something happens, and you end up betraying somebody. You end up sinning. You end up falling short. You end up making a mistake. And the enemy comes and says, see, you were never who you thought you were. You never had what it took, Peter. You thought you would die for him, but you can't even admit his name in front of a middle-aged, a middle school-aged girl. You are nothing, Peter, and you will never be anything. See, the enemy comes in right there over the fireplace where you fail God. And I felt this today, that there was these oppressive thoughts that are breaking into people's lives. I felt during worship that the Lord wanted to set us free today, like he set Peter. And now we're going to get into the, the resurrection power of Jesus. And today, I just want you to, to, to open your heart up that he would take away, and not only take away, but redeem the place where the enemy has been calling you weak, the place where he has been calling you a fake the place where he's been calling you a hypocrite, the place where he's been calling you not good enough, you don't measure up, you don't have what it takes, everyone's got it, everyone's got it figured out, but you can't get over the hump. You will never be what you said you would be. You're the opposite. If, you, if anyone's hearing that voice today, today there is deliverance in the name of Jesus. What's the good news? Peter discovered what God wants you to discover today is that the story doesn't end with you. Your story doesn't end with you. That's good news for somebody. He went, when you went into the night weeping over your betrayal, your sin, your fear, your anxiety, your depression, the thing that you cannot overcome despite your deepest desire to rise above, when you went into the night afraid and weeping, Jesus went into the night with a plan. He looked you in the eye and he said, you're the joy set before me, I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> It's not the end of the story. He became your depression. He became your betrayal. He became your adultery. He became your addiction. He became your anxiety. He became your fear. He became your greatest moment of failure. He took it to the grave. Your storyline and narrative of how you don't measure up, how you failed, and how you will again fell into the grave in a man named Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And he who knew no sin became your sin so that you might become his righteousness. Yeah. yeah, it's good news. <laughs> I have good news for you. It's not when you, when it, it, it already happened. Peter understood it when Jesus came to him, but Jesus already did it. Your redemption happened 2,000 years ago. If you sinned tonight, 2,000 years ago, he looked at you across that fire pit. He looked at you across that fire pit and he said, I choose you. I choose you again. I'm going to go to the cross for that moment. I'm going to go to the cross for that betrayal. Where is your sin today? <laughs> this is good news. Where is your sin today? He who knew no sin became your sin and died for it. Your sin is present, past, or future is dead in him. It is not alive in you. That's why it's called dead works. You're a zombie. You're walking dead. That's why there's no life in sin. Not because there's no, because Jesus took the power and became its power. What is the wages of sin? Death. Jesus swallowed death in victory. That's why death has no sting and no power anymore because the name of Jesus has overcome that which had power over you. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. This is why Jesus Christ is the only way. There is no other man who has no sin who became your sin and died for it. There is no other God who has become your sin and died for it. 
There is no other name. And risen again. <laughs> He's on the shores of your heart to bring you back to life. He's on the shores of your disappointment saying, I call you again. I do. I choose you. I want you. And the moment you say yes, he will bring you to the place of your insecurity, your fear, your pain, your failure. And he will say, tell me you love me. Because I know you do. He says, you can't even love me unless you understand how much I love you. He's not there saying, prove it to me, Peter. He's there saying, you need to know that apart from my presence, you fall short. You wanted to die for me because I put that in you, but in your own effort, you will deny me to a middle school child. <laughs> in your own effort, you will not heal anybody. In your own effort, you will not preach my gospel. In your own effort, you will not measure up, Peter, but at this fireplace on this beach, after I called you to myself, I will do it through you. And I want you to know that I believe in you. I believe in you. Do you know what the word redeem means? I've heard this Christian word my whole life, and I love this definition. It actually was like, oh my gosh, I love this word now. To gain or regain possession of something in an exchange for payment. <laughs> when he redeemed you, he didn't like shine your car and like, oh, let me just take away that little stain. Ugh. He died. He, listen to this. He gained or regained possession of you in exchange for his own life. You say, I'm in sin. Uh, he bought that sin. Yeah, I have a master called addiction. Jesus actually bought that master. He came into your temple and strong-armed him, took him down to the grave, and that master is still down there. So what if I'm in sin? You know what it is? It's lies. It's lies. As you think in your mind, so you are. I'm not saying that you need to think harder or try harder. I'm saying the power of that sin over your life, the bondage of sin, that's what it is. It's a bondage. It's a yoke meaning you are enslaved to its duty and purpose. You will follow that addiction until it dies in Jesus. It will morph into a different way, a different addiction if, you, if it just gets counseled. Counseling's not bad. But what, what it does is it just morphs into a different place. Now I have to not be around these 700 people. I have to have this regimented thing so that I can have peace. That's not Jesus. It's not shame if you struggle with that. I have struggled with that. So I'm just up here calling the pot kettle black. What's that? How does that go? Something like that. <laughs> I'm telling you where I found freedom is where I realized that him, he who knew no sin became my sin. And let me tell you something. This will be an equaling to the leveling of the field. Got it? Um, I have a hard time with my words. Uh, anything apart from faith is sin. Well, that makes us all equal. Anything apart from faith, which comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God is rhema. Anything apart from the faith that you get from hearing the spirit of God speak to you is your own effort. It's poop. It's poop. It doesn't matter what it is. God does not care what you do for him in your own strength, including trying to get free. God is not impressed by your penance, if that's the right word, by your uh, sadness, um, self-hatred, anger, or discouragement that doesn't move his Richter scale. The more angry you are at the sin does not move his power. It's when you look at Jesus and say, it died in him. It's finished. Some of you need to declare to your struggle today, it's finished. It's done. I am done shadow boxing. I'm done fighting. I'm done running into the night with my tears. I'm going to be, I'm going to show up on the shore and Jesus is going to be there too. He's going to call my name again. It's always been in his name that we have salvation. So today, let's all stand up. Let's, uh, worship team, maybe if you guys could come back up. We're going to do that Oh the Cross song one more time. Today I want to say to you, okay, I want you to look at me and listen to me. Only Jesus Christ 
can redeem you. Only Jesus Christ can set you free from yourself. He alone has the power. And the same Jesus Christ of Nazareth that showed up on the shores of the Lake of Galilee three and a half years after he did the first time and called Peter will show up today and every day for the rest of your life on the shores of your heart and he will call you by name. He will call you by name. He will call you to your destiny. He will call you into glory. He will give it all back to you for free. I want you to think about if there's anything in your heart, anything in your heart that is, that is between you. It's not between you and him for Jesus, but for you it is. It's something that you cannot overcome. It's something that you cannot be set free from. It's something that you cannot give up. It's something that has power over you. I want you to be like Peter today. I want you to be like Peter today. Dive in to that water. Dive in to the water after Jesus this morning. Come to him and surrender to him afresh. This is the same thing. If you've never given Jesus your heart, come to him in your heart. He is on the shore of your heart right now in this very moment. And he's saying, I call you home, daughter. I call you home, son. I want you. I accept you the way you are. And I will change your life. I have overcome that addiction. I have overcome that sin. I have overcome that failure and that fear. I have overcome your questions. I have overcome your doubts. I have overcome everything that is dark within you. even if you've believed in Jesus your whole life, if there's areas that you cannot step over, a broken marriage, broken finances, broken body, unforgiveness, insecurity, pain, resentment, I want you to do the same thing today. As we sing this song, we're gonna worship him for what he's done. We're gonna declare, it is finished, it is done. I'm alive in you, you are alive in me. If you haven't ever given your life to Jesus, I want you just to pray this with me. Jesus, if that's you today, just pray this with me. Jesus, I give you everything. I give you my heart, my mind, and my body. I give you my entire life. You can have all of me. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe I am who you say I am. And I receive you afresh this morning. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my heart. And now I want you to pray this. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. You are the Lord of my heart. Let's sing this song together. Please don't leave for the duration of this song. Afterwards, you can totally leave, okay? But take this time just to surrender afresh. Don't hold back this morning. Surrender afresh. Dive in the boat or dive in the water. Dive off the boat, okay? Carry the cross upon your back, bleeding until your final breath. Tears of blood, crown of thorns. You gave it all the sins you bore.
you guys want, come to the front. If God is stirring you, if you feel his power, his love, if you feel him moving your heart, come to the front, come to the altar. Come to the altar. Surrender and lay it down at the altar this morning. Don't hold back. Don't sit in the seat, dive off the boat. Come to the altar this morning. It's all open. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Change history. The nails in your hands. The hands will save me. The grave will see. Death lost the scene as a lion roar in victory. A sacrifice, a changed history. The nails in your hands, the hands that save me.
as the band is playing, you know, it says in the Bible that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation is healed, saved, delivered, set free, made safe and sound. So today our prayer team is going to come up here. You guys stay up here that are already up here. Just stay up here. And if you need something that only the power of God can overcome, come today to the front and get prayer. Our prayer ministers will just have a hand up or there'll be the people lined up here, okay? I want you to come and get prayer. Do you need healing? Do you need deliverance? Do you need freedom? The gospel of Christ is the power of God on salvation. It has been declared and released today. If you want to over, I feel like, like if you want to overcome something today, come to the front. The Holy Spirit will release it today in Jesus' name. stay here in this moment so we don't want anything to change up front but if you need to leave or go get your kids or go home that's totally okay feel free to go we're gonna keep pressing in for a little bit longer um, for those who who are here to get freedom today don't hesitate to come up